Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is Una Daly from the Community College Consortium for OER. And welcome to our last uh, Open Education Week webinar on mathematics. And we have uh, Nikki Stubbs here with us uh, from the Technical College System of Georgia. She's the EdTech coordinator there, and she's also one of the VPs on our Executive Council. And she will be our facilitator today and introduce you to the two uh, math faculty who are going to talk to us today about their OER adoptions. Okay, Nikki? Hi, and welcome, everybody. Um, so today we have two professors. One is Dr. Larry Green, who is a math professor with Lake Tahoe Community College of California. Um, he's also a ZTC degree grant manager. And we also have Jody Cotton Consor, um, Dr. Jody Cotton Consor, who is also a math professor out of Westchester Community College, um, the SUNY system of New York. And Jody, I just want to confirm real quick that your audio is okay um, as, as we move forward. I can hear you. Can you guys hear me? Yes, wonderful. Okay. Welcome. So today what we're going to do is have um, kind of a faculty Q&A dialogue. Um, and so as we're walking through this, we're going to ask the faculty a few questions and you, uh, you both just feel free to chime in. Um, we may go a little out of order depending on how the conversation goes. Um, and if anyone has questions as we are going along, if you will please pop those in the chat, uh, in the chat message. Um, and we will try to answer them um, in the order that we get them and if it's relevant at the moment to um, to what we're on topic for um, if not we'll try to hold everything till the end and uh, and try to get to your questions then so um, Jody and Larry we're going to go ahead and start um, and so this first part is really just some guiding questions to tell us about your OER experience. So these are the four questions kind of that we have in the beginning. And I'm going to read them out for those of you um, who may be calling in, who may be listening and maybe not be able to see your screen. So the first question is to please tell us how long you've been teaching and what courses you teach and anything we should know specifically about students at your college. So um, Larry, do you want to head that one off? Sure, sure. Um, I'll uh, talk about it. So I've been teaching since the beginning of time, <laughs> about, uh, <laughs> I guess, uh, over 30 years, just a little more than 30 years, 32 years, I think. Um, so I've always taught. Uh, I teach at a community college. So I teach all of our community college courses, but lately um, I've been doing a lot of st uh, elementary statistics and a lot of the calculus series and the differential equations and the linear algebra class. Um, I will teach the um, basic skills classes, but mostly I do statistics and the calculus through linear algebra. Um, our college is pretty unique, I think. And in fact, um, let me show you. If you can see. Larry, if at any time you need to share your screen. Also, Jody, if you have anything that you want us to visually see, just let me know and I'll um, I'll yeah. call sharing and then you can do that. What I was showing you, if you could see it, um, was white. Um, we're Tahoe and we have 10 feet of snow right now. Ooh. And that's the way it is. We get blizzards, keep students out. Um, there's a lot of stuff that has to be done online um, because students can't always get here. Um, my vehicle to work is very unique. It's this guy. Uh oh, hold on. I'm going to stop sharing so we can see yours. <laughs> so I see. Oh my gosh. Every day. I think I'm the only one in the country that does that, probably. Maybe not. And, um, but so we're, we're different. Um, we're low income, though, because there's no good industry here other than tourism, which doesn't pay a lot. So our students are, are low income, challenged in a big way in terms of financial, but it's beautiful up here. Awesome, thank you. Um, so Jody, I'm gonna reshare the questions real quick. Um, there you go. Um, and so Jody, if you wanna catch question one for us as an introduction. 
Sure, I've been teaching for, I actually was counting this back a couple days ago, 30 years, I can't believe it. Um, been teaching at the community college level since 1998 when I got my master's degree. And um, for all but four of those years, I've uh, been at Westchester Community College in Valhalla, New York, which is about 20 miles north of New York City. Um, I usually teach, right now my load for the last seven, eight years has been Calc 1, 2, 3 and differential equations. Um, students at our college, oh my gosh, we have from the richest of the rich to the poorest of the poor in Westchester. We have, you know, up in Bedford and Bedford Hills, we've got the David Letterman and the all of that and then we've got clear down you know into the bronx and, and some people that even take the bus up from the city to westchester so um very diverse um ethnicity and um for the richest to the poorest well barbara i'm gonna let you barbara i'm sorry um jody i'm gonna let you lead into the second question so um how are you first introduced to oer and what motivated you to use it i first heard about oer at um amatic the american mathematics association of two-year colleges yearly conference it's been probably three or four years ago now and my husband and i were looking at one of the publishers booths and he's not a mathematician um, he's a quality control manager for general dynamics but he always goes with me he loves math and um, always talking about it with me but he tapped on my shoulder and he says hey joe there's a differential equations textbook over here that's free and free what is this so i went over to look at it and it was the trench differential equations book and i thought i have to do this i have to help students out with the ridiculous cost of these textbooks because i know there were many times that um, students didn't have a textbook they would go to the library and hope nobody had checked that one out or they would go to the tutorial but then the tutorial is only open um, a few days a week um excuse me at night anyway um and only certain days during the week and so a colleague and i decided that we would pilot the openstax calculus textbooks and at the end of that first semester oh gosh this always gets me emotional <laughs> i surveyed my students um because one of our deans had asked me to give the keynote to a, a suny oer event here on our campus and I asked them what they liked about the the OpenStax textbook, what they didn't like. And what I got back has motivated me and always will motivated me, motivate me to continue. To them, it was just a textbook. They want the homework problems to do. Um, some students read the textbook. Most don't, even when you get, you know, upper calculus level and differential equations level. Um, but the one that hit me the most is that he said, Professor, many of the times he, he said every semester it's the choice between a textbook and a bus ticket. And he says, I'm trying to better my life and make a better life for my family than what I grew up in. And he says, and so when I have that choice, it's the bus ticket to get to school. So every time I'm tired and I, because it is a lot of extra work, um, I just remember him and his response of it's, it's the choice of the bus ticket. Awesome, thank you. I think we can all relate to that. Um, I know um, I taught at two of our colleges um, before um, moving into the position at the system office and, um, I think we probably all have similar situations where um, our students are facing a daily struggle and it, it really is something, you know, as um, something most people probably take for granted is, you know, is my power bill going to be on this week or am I going to have water or am I going to be able to feed my kids? Yeah. Um, 
And so it's, uh, it can be difficult, it can be very difficult. So um, I know your students appreciate everything that you're doing. So I do want to ask, we had a question from the community. Do you happen to know um, the, the student population size at your college, Jody? Oh gosh, it's huge. Okay. <laughs> I'm thinking somewhere like 20,000 full time. Okay. Okay. In the day. Yeah. Um, it's, it's big. Okay. We are. Right. Una answered Wiki Wikipedia. <laughs> Wikipedia has it at um, 27,802. <laughs> yeah. We're the only community college in Westchester County. Okay. Um, so the next question for, um, we'll, we'll pass this over to Larry is what OER materials are you using and what was the process of adopting OER like for you? Um, so that's kind of a long question. We are using um, in our math department and me personally, we are, we have become an OER math department. So we are using OpenStax for everything we can. So um, that was our go to textbook place. So we're using OpenStax from um, all the way from um, pre algebra through uh, Calc 3 is what most people call it, although it's fourth quarter, we're on the quarter system, um, fourth quarter calculus. We're using, we're using linear algebra, um, OER by, no, it's uh, Hefferman, Hefferon, but we're gonna change that to Lyrics next year. We like that book better. And that's the thing with OER, you, can, you, you don't have to stay with the book as long as there's another one. Um, and then for our differential equations, we're using the Trench book, but my feeling is that the book is actually a very small piece of it. Um, you talk to students and they spend a very small amount of time on the book in terms of learning compared to watching videos and going to the online homework system. So we're using um, My Open Math for the online homework system in all of our courses. Um, wow. I set that, all of, our, all of our math courses, I should say. So every math course uses my open math. And we also use a lot of other materials. So I've, I'm a programmer. I've done a lot of programming and created OER materials. Um, so for example, I created my own spreadsheet program for statistics. And we use that for statistics. Um, and lots of interactive activities. That's a great thing about OER is you don't have to stick with what the book has only. Is that you can go and find things from all over the place, put them together, and now you have your system. And we've done, we've done that a lot. Uh, we also use a lot of, I don't know if it's officially OER, but YouTube videos. Uh, I don't know if you call those, I don't, know, I don't know licensing all that, but I call them OER enough because the students don't care as long as they don't have to pay. <laughs> so we have a lot of linked videos to, from the books and the materials and all of that, I found the students do a lot more video watching than text reading, textbook reading. Um, and because we're a small college, I, I see them a lot. Um, so they do a lot of video watching. And so we have lots of videos support for all of our content in math. Um, in terms of the ado adopting OER, what was the process of adopting? So I'm kind of the beginning of it is I did it many, many, many years ago. I don't think the name OER was there yet, okay? Um, and in fact, I did it in 1994 to start, and it definitely wasn't there. People didn't know what the internet was. That was the beginning of OER. I wrote my own OER materials. Um, so adopting was easy when I wrote it. And then um, Barbara Lowski's here. We adopted her book as the first book. And thank you, Barbara, for um, putting that out as an open educational resource. Um, it hasn't been a problem. And I have convinced our entire department now, our whole department is OER, not just my classes. Um, but there's, there's a learning curve. There's a learning curve, there is work involved. But once you get into it and you get the feel for it, it's not any harder than non-OER stuff. So the process was, you just look at the materials and you say what's well, gonna work for your curriculum and for your teaching style and then I put it in my syllabus. Pretty simple. So I want to um, just let everybody know some information from chat. So um, 
Barbara mentioned that some YouTube videos are OER. Um, when you upload a video, you have the option to go into the um, advanced area and choose a Creative Commons by license. Um, but the default is not a CC by license. It's a general standard, standard YouTube license. Um, so, um, and, and, um, so that's something to remember when you're searching, if you, if you want true open resources. So like if you want to take that video and do something with it, um, besides linking to it, like if you need to edit it or do anything to it by any way, um, then you want to definitely look for that CC by license, um, on the video. And then we had a question from the audience from Jennifer Loudermilk. Um, hi Jennifer. Um, so do you house your extra content, your videos or notes, um, et cetera, in an LMS such as Blackboard, um, Desire to Learn Canvas, or do you house everything in my open app? We, I house a lot in Canvas, um, but a lot of it is links to stuff. Okay. Stuff that I've created myself, I put on the college web server, and then it gets housed by, LT, about, by Lake Tahoe Community College. Okay. I've done a lot of that too. Um, but um, in the last few years, we've moved to Canvas, um, which is, if you don't know, is uh, LMS. Yes. So we have, I have created uh, Canvas shells for each of the courses, and then I have a plethora of items in Canvas. I believe in having a whole lot more than the students can handle, but you let them choose what's best for their learning style. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Jody, do you want to um, pick up on that? What what type of OER materials are you using currently, and um, what was the process of adopting like for you? We are currently using OpenStax for calculus, and we're using David Lippman's book for our quantitative reasoning course. And that's pretty much like what Larry said is that OpenStax is it, except for the Littman book. The Littman book is the only one we've really found for quantitative reasoning, and it's a good book. Um, the process of adopting, I was out on a medical leave for a semester, half, half leave, I taught online and, and did a project. And the project was to research open or OER materials for all of our courses. And from that list, then, um, a bunch of us got together and we picked what we thought were the best ones to use. And so we have uh, currently 15 in our department. We are in the process of hiring three more. Um, so, and I have, I'm a co-chair of the department and I staff the adjuncts and I have 80 adjuncts. So we have a ton, I know, <laughs> it's wild. Uh, we have a lot of people, so we have, given right now people a choice. They can use the publisher's textbook or they can use the OER. And I'm really good at shaming people <laughs> as to like, um, you know, if, you, if I honestly have said in a department meeting, if you're still using that publisher's textbook, here's what you're doing to your students. Um, and then they all just took at me these days, but I don't stop. Um, let's see. So it's been kind of up and down for adopting. We've had some that started using OpenStax for calculus and they went back to the Stewart book. Um, it's, it's a lot of work, a lot. Um, I put in, um, well, that's more question number four, I guess, is how has my teaching changed? But for me, I give guided notes to all of my students for every section that we do in class. And so whenever I change textbooks, I have to change all those guided notes. And so that's a lot of work. As far as where we, like you're asking Larry about the, the videos, I, I record all of my class lectures every semester and I put them up in Blackboard so mm -hmm. that um, students have access to that if they miss class or they wanna just listen again. At first I thought maybe they would use that as a reason to miss class but I think if they think that they quickly find out in the classes that I'm teaching that that doesn't work. So um, they use them to listen to them again. And those are in Blackboard. 
Right. Okay. Thank you. So do you want to go ahead and, and answer four while we're here? So what, what has changed? Um, obviously you, you mentioned that some things may have changed in the way you teach the course. It, anything besides, you know, sharing those lecture notes and, um, and those guided notes to the students. Have you, have you found yourself making any other modifications to the way that you're presenting information to them? I think I'm a better teacher. It, it's made me go out and look for resources that are not there in those big publisher textbooks. And I've had to go out, I'm not, if I have one gripe about the OpenStax book is that there's not enough problems. And so I have gone out and found extra you know, free worksheets for students and, and sometimes written my own problems to enhance those as well. So I think for me, I've become a better teacher. Awesome. Thank you. Larry, do you want to piggyback off of that at all? Um, in terms of things that I've changed, the main thing, I think I'm also more up to date because I search for things. Um, one of the things is I've been almost, I've been in Merlot for, on the board forever, basically, since the beginning of Merlot. And I'm the chair of the Merlot board, which means I get to see all the stuff that comes in. And there's a lot going in. That's one of the hard parts about Merlot. There's so much going in that you can't even find stuff. Um, so I, have gotten to the point where I get to see everything that's out there and I can bring things in. Also, because we're not tied to a textbook, I bring a lot more current events in. I teach statistics as a, one of my main classes. So it gets me to come in and go find a news article on something that's going on today and bring that into my class. And I can literally change the OER the day before so that the students are reading has today's information. And you can't do that with just a flat textbook as well. Um, and I make videos um, just like um, just like was mentioned. Every course has every section has a video that I've done, long and short. I got both. Um, so it's gotten me to do a lot more um, collecting. Harvesting might be the better word. That's great. I think um, I think what most people find with um, transitioning to OER um, and then sticking with it for a while, they'll find that um, keeping their courses current and keeping themselves current is um, easier because you're already out there and you're constantly updating. Um, I know when I taught, I, I did use publisher material, but um, I was in the design and media program and I was constantly updating my term, my, my courses every term. Um, and so uh, in moving to OER, it's even, even more so you're updating constantly. Um, and, and really that's what makes you better teachers. You know, that's what that, that helps you hone your skill a little bit. Um, and it shows your students too, that, um, that you're human and you have new things to learn and new ways, um, new ways of presenting information and, and I, th I think a lot of people will find that when they move to OER, that will be the case for them as well. Um, so before we move to the next few questions, is there anything else, um, Larry or, um, or Jody, that you'd like to add? Just one I didn't mention, um, because it, you didn't ask me about this, but specific questions about you know, why we moved to OER. Mm -hmm. I used to have students when I taught, whatever I taught, we, had, we used my, my, my math lab. And I talked to them a week too, why haven't you done your homework? And the student couldn't afford it. And I can't just say, I'm sorry, you failed my class because you don't have money. Mm -hmm. um, I just couldn't do that. And to me, that was the absolute number one reason why we got to go to OER. It's just not fair to tell a student they have to fail because they can't afford the $120 for the online homework system. Yeah, um, I agree. I, I sent an, um, an email just last week um, from um, some updates um, from a, a report that was found that UGA, the UGA OER report that came out um, in November. And um, my question to a handful of colleagues was that if our students are coming into our colleges um, and we are tying ourselves to student success, how can we really be 
setting up setting those students up for success if the first thing we're asking them to do is pay hundreds of dollars um, for the textbook when most of them can't even afford the tuition most of our students are financial aid students um, and I, in in the community college world um, that's normally the case um, and so I think that um, I think that's where it all starts really um, Larry is you know students again the realities of um, the financial college burden for students so um, I, I commend you both for recognizing that and um, and taking action for it and so the second part is um, the last of the questions um, and we are doing good on time, I believe. So um, I, I want to ask if you have had any responses for your students um, about OER. I know, um, Jody, you mentioned, you know, uh, um, your situation with some of your students um, um, with your, um, your like, focus group question. But um, are there any, have you done any um, assessments or surveys uh, regarding student success rates and then um, do you have any feedback from your students and, and how they have responded to using OER? They tell me that it helps them reduce their stress because it's one less thing they have to worry about. They can buy the bus ticket, they can pay the gas bill, they can put food on the table um, and that's another you know big motivation. They're already stressed as it is you know, even more so than when any of us were in college, I think. Um, so every semester I send out emails um, starting at about a month before classes start and I say, I'm using the OpenStax textbook, do not buy the Stewart book. Um, here's a link to the textbook and the number of thank yous that I get back from students every semester is, It is just, it's so worth it to have them appreciate it. And I think, and I said before, I think to them, it's a textbook. You know, they're, um, they want the homework assignment. And they also, oh gosh, they also, they don't care about all the color and all, <laughs> and all the history. In fact, I had a conversation, um, the big publisher reps don't really stop by my office anymore. Um, which really hasn't bothered me. Um, but I, the last conversation I had with one of the publisher reps was that, I said, you know, you and I love that history stuff in the textbooks, but chances are most of our students don't read it. I don't care about the color. They don't care about the color. I don't care that it's a 13th edition. Um, you know, when you get to the fourth and fifth and sixth edition, isn't it kind of redundant to be given, putting out a new edition because the textbook we were using, they would change like section 2.3 problem seven from y equals x to the fourth to y equals x to the sixth. And I, I said to the rep, I said, there is no difference in these two problems. Oh, I can assure you that, I'm not supposed to mention his name with the author, but I can assure you that they are pedagogically necessary I said, okay, so then you have Ron Larson call me. Of course, he never did. Um, but it's ridiculous past that. And so have you, um, I'm going to follow up. We had a question um, for Larry, I believe, for my math lab. But Larry, do you want to mention um, about your students? Have they responded at all? How, how have they responded to the OER? And have you, um, have you guys put anything out for student success rates? Uh, I'll tell you, they respond in two words. Thank you. Yep. I hear that more than any two words. I've never heard a student say, we need to go back to the publisher. We need to have the publisher version. I never hear that. Um, what it is is, and this is something that it's an economics issue. And if any of you have studied economics, in terms of supply and demand curves, um, textbooks are an inelastic purchase. And what that means is if you raise the price, the students aren't going to say, well, I'm gonna buy the cheaper book because they don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. 
So the, the, the person to decide on what book to use is not the person that's buying the book. Um, the same thing happens with healthcare. Yep. And it's the same reason why textbook prices, actually, if you've looked at the math, textbook prices in healthcare have gone up at almost the same rate. Textbook prices are actually a little higher than healthcare care, believe, believe it or not. And for the students, they get punished because they got to pay, but they don't, need, they don't get to make the choice. They don't make the economic decision. They just have to pay. The instructor is the one that makes the decision. And that's one of the tough ones is that the instructor doesn't have to pay. It's easier to use the publisher because the publisher just does everything for you, but it's definitely not easier for the student. And it, it's a problem. It's a problem. And I think they've gotten to be so high that now we have a big OER movement because we need to do something about it. And this is what we're doing. Um, the other main difference is that with OER, it's a community with a publisher, it's someone giving you a textbook. Mm -hmm. Very different. Um, so in terms of using the, the book, the students tell me what they'd like changed. They say, you know, this, this particular part wasn't very good. And I've, um, I have a group, we've developed our whole homework system, it's all OER. And they let me know, and you know what I do? I go and fix it. And then the next term, new students tell me but of course, they have less severe things to tell me because the last students have already helped improve it for this particular class. Um, and that's something you get with OER, which you don't get with publisher books and publisher um, open homework systems, because uh, publisher homework systems. It's the homework systems they care most about. And the fact that we can react to the students' needs individually and make changes on our own for them really makes it worth it. And the students very much like it. Um, as a statistician, I can't tell you about our success rate because our sample size is too small. <laughs> and I think I would, and my students would get mad at me if I tried to use a sample size of 22 and came, came up with a p-value on that and tried to do statistics on it. We're a really tiny college. So we've done surveys, but they're, they're, our sample size is just too small to really have a good analysis on it. And again, as a statistics professor, I just couldn't do that. <laughs> but I can tell you individually, they tell me thank you a lot. <laughs> um, so Jody, do you happen to have um, any success rate um, information by any chance? No, we haven't okay. done any stats on that. I don't think right now from looking at the Knowing the past failure rates of classes now, I don't think it's really changed any. Okay. Um, if maybe, if it has, maybe it's improved a little bit more because it has taken off a lot of stress. Um, so for um, Jody, we'll pick up with you. What changes um, might you make to improve the courses um, that you have now? So as you were, um, as you are updating your courses, what are you finding um, that you feel like you may be changing the most or um, what changes are you uh, anticipating that you'd like to make? I think writing more problems um, for the OpenStax textbook. We have uh, one of my colleagues, Matt Regala, he's the one that piloted the OpenStax with me the first semester. And he's in the process, and it's, it's been over a year now, and we hope to have Calc 1 ready for the fall. Um, but OpenStax will be in Lumen Learning. Um, and that's Matt, so we can go in and correct some of the errors that are in OpenStax. We can also write more problems and put them in the OpenStax and Lumen, and, and also you know, my open math or wherever else we can put them to help people with the homework. Awesome. Um, and what, so Larry, do you have any, um, any changes that you are anticipating making with your courses? Uh, before um, that, I just want to respond to what she said. Okay. Um, we, just are, we, we just finished a grant where we had a big team of workers to work on my open math. And we created thousands of questions. And they all go with OpenStax. 
and there we are. You have access to them. Um, not a problem. You just go in and you can take them. And if you, for some reason, you don't want digital, you know, mass style, you can do print copy and you can print them out. They're open. You can even copy and paste them into whatever you're doing. That's what OER is all about. Yeah. So that's the first thing is that um, we did that for all the way from beginning algebra through um, Calc 3. Okay, which we call fourth quarter, but you know the. And you said that's in my open math, Larry. What's that? That's in my open math. Yep, in my open math. Oh heavens, you just made my day. <laughs> yeah, so there is a plethora <laughs> of questions. My only request is that if you have suggestions, let me know, and I can make them better. Because <laughs> that's what it's all about. To me, it's all about a, a team instead of a publisher or an author saying, "This is what I've got. Take it or leave it." Um, the idea is we're supposed to be a team working on this stuff. I think that's going to help some of ours that left OpenStax and went back to the Stewart book. Yeah, yeah, that can help. Yeah. Um, yeah, that definitely can help. So we definitely have, again, I have that my open math piece. And in terms of what changes you might make, I think that was a question, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm always making changes. And that's what I was trying to say, is that that's the whole point is that we can always make changes and make it better. I made three changes this morning at um, 4.30 in the morning. Don't ask, I wake up early. Um, and I added more to it every single day. I'm adding, but are, am I like doing fundamental black and white changes? No, it's all these little modifications. And then each year it gets better and better and better and better. And that's the idea. That, that's kind of how... Um, my open math works. You can take and take and leave anybody's questions or whatever. You can do that. Uh, let me share just one second. Okay, let me stop sharing. And we do have yeah, another. Yeah, I don't share question. my screen. I can just share um, the link. Oh, okay. In the in the uh, in the chat, please. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so we have a question um, from Jennifer Loudermilk. Uh, do you have suggestions on how to search for good, unbroken, highly used problems? in my open math. This may be more, uh, this may be more offline question, <laughs> um, but, but yeah, it's there, a, you have a good question. There, there are search functions in it. Mm -hmm. The other thing you can do is you can grab a course mm -hmm. and you can use that to start and then add more in okay. by just using the search feature. Um, the unbroken, that's the thing. If it's broken, you just don't use it, but you might have to check. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's broken as one of mine, instead of just don't use it, you just hit the message, the author, and then I'll make it unbroken. Um, I do that every morning. Uh, <laughs> so that's just awesome. a note is that it definitely works. Let me um, I'll check this out. See, this is what I like about it. I just went to the, to my Google sheet, the Google uh, thing that has this, and I got three people looking at it right now. <laughs> And uh, so let me copy the link in for everyone. So I'm, I did a Google Doc on how to get started with Bible Math and where our courses are in a bunch of courses. It gives a course ID. So you can go to that ID and you can look at all our questions. Are they perfect? Absolutely not. <laughs> but we, we, we're always going to improve. It's never going to be perfect. But it'll get better and better and better, you know, each each time people give feedback and I can make them better. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that, Larry. I think a lot of people are going to find that super helpful who are interested in, um, um, in the mom platform, my open math platform. Yeah. It's um, a great platform, by the way. Mm -hmm. Can I address the OER and um, Lumen and my open math question on chat? Sure. Uh, if you are a and at a SUNY college, State University of New York, um, and you use Lumen, SUNY has partnered with Lumen, and so it's free. Um, but my understanding about the difference with the $25 fee that you pay for Lumen versus it being free, and if anybody knows, please, please correct me if I'm incorrect, um, is that it's going to be a lot easier to access a course. Um, I lost my train of thought. And things are housed more in a compact area. 
And I know that David Littman is working with Lumen um, right now. That's about all I know about what the $25 fee is for. So I'm going to piggyback off that um, since I just met with the Lumen folks um, cool. last week at the open conference in Florida. Um, and um, I know a couple of our colleges here in the technical support, uh, technical college system are, are doing that. But um, so the $25 fee, Jennifer's um, has approached a couple of these. So instructor support, LMS integration assistance. Um, one of the other things that it covers is also a lot of data on the backside of what your students are doing and how they're performing. Um, and so as opposed to just linking to the textbook um, and the resources, it also gives you some back end resources that your LMS may not be able to provide if you're just using um, the textbook and the video resources. Um, sort of kind of all encompassing in, within your LMS. So um, the $25 fee, it, it is my understanding that also covers some of that backend data that instructors would like to, uh, would like to know. And so Una's given me the warning, we've got about four minutes left. So, um, and um, so the last guiding question, so any takeaways, um, Larry or, uh, or Jody, advice, words of wisdom to faculty who are um, using or considering using OER for their courses? Um, one thing I would mention is that there are people like myself and, and a lot of other people out there who have been doing this for a long time. So if we have someone coming in for the first time, my recommendation is don't try and create the entire course by themselves. Um, what they can do is they can copy one of our courses and then modify it as they start teaching it. Otherwise, it will be absolutely overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So again, it's much easier to just copy someone else's class and then maybe the second time around, make modifications to work for them instead of try to start from scratch. And OER is all about not having to start from scratch. That's exactly what I would say. Um, okay, in, any, do you want to add anything to that? Don't, don't start by yourself. Have somebody else in your department doing it with you. I think that was a great help when Matt and I started together on this. And then just be prepared for a lot of work, but also remember that, like Larry said, there's a lot of us out there that have done a lot of work so already, and now that I know he's got all those calculus problems out there, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go get them. And it's gonna, you know, reduce the, the work that I have to put in and then share those with the rest of my department. I wanna mention one more thing, and I wanna, it's more of an offer. Um, I'd be happy to chat with anybody just on one-on-one -on -one Zoom. I have my own Zoom also. One-on-one um, -on -one Zoom, I could chat Zoom with your whole department or whatever and kind of show you around. And you know, I'm happy to do that as long as I don't have to miss my class for it. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. <laughs> you know, from me, very glad to do that with anybody. Thank you both so much. Um, so we've got, we want to be mindful. Larry has a class um, at one, and so we don't want to uh, impede that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share a few more things. And then Jody, if you want to hang around for a few minutes afterwards, please feel free. We may have a couple of more questions that come in. Um, so we do have some upcoming conferences. If you go on our website and look under Get Involved, um, there is a list um, of conferences that are coming up. Most of them are um, at the national or state level type conferences. Um, I do want to say that we're working on um, kind of expanding that. So if you are at a college who has some type of OER, um, conference or a system that has an OER conference, um, do let us know. You can always email myself um, or Una. Um, we want to try to expand on that. Um, if you are inviting or would like to invite participants, even though it may be a college conference um, that are outside of your college or your system, please let us know so that we can, um, we can share those with the community as well. 
Um, and then we do have a community email um, link here for you as well, where you can stay in touch with us um, through our community email, which is extremely active. And then I want to mention our spring webinar series. So obviously this week, March 4th through the 8th, um, we are wrapping it up today. Um, and again, if you missed any this week, they are recorded. Um, so you will be able to watch them after the fact. Um, and then we have April 3rd, the OER connection with dual enrollment. May 8th, the OER ZTC degree pathways webinar. And then June 5th, we have our regional models for OER implementation and um, further descriptions and a registration link available there as well. And then lastly, um, we want to say thank you. So thanks for those of you who stuck around for um, 45 minutes or so to hang out with us. Um, we do have someone asking if we could share contact info again for Larry and Jody. So I don't, let me just double check. I don't think your contact info was in the very front. Nope. Um, so if Larry or Jody, if you want to share your contact info in the chat, that would be wonderful. Can I mention something too? Absolutely. On May the 3rd in Rio Hondo College in Southern California, and May the 4th in um, Solano Community College in Northern California, we're having a pre-statistics OER workshop. And all, all are invited to come to that. And it's um, sponsored through our Academic um, Senate for California Community Colleges. And it's a workshop not a talk. It's where you're going to come and build a course. And we're going to show you how to do that. And by the end, you should have a course, maybe not polished, but at least started um, by the end of the workshop. All of we are. For, this is for the pre-statistics, statistics, stats co-rec, which is a big thing in California right now. Wow. That's amazing. So if any of you are local to that area, um, check it out because that's going to be incredible to kind of walk away with getting started um, and or a course. <laughs> so again, I want to thank everybody um, for joining us on this very last day of our Open Ed Week. Um, we're so glad that you could make it here on a, uh, on a Friday. Um, and it looks like I don't think I have any outstanding questions from the chat. For those of you who are interested, um, we did get a, um, Paul Golish is here um, from Lumen Learning. So the term, he was mentioning that the terms of use between mom um, and ohm are very different. And he's happy to send uh, the different terms of use to all those who are interested. And, and he's put his email up in the chat. So. Um, if you want to reach out to Paul for additional, uh, additional information, that would be great. Um, Una, is there anything else that we would like to cover? I think we're great. Awesome. Th thank you, guys. Thank you, Larry and Jody, for joining us. Um, wealth of information today um, for, um, for math. Um, I think math for me is probably one of the harder ones um, for some of our faculty. Uh, it's a hard transition and it's a lot of work. Um, and when you have a lot of faculty, um, it, it, takes, um, it takes a lot of effort um, to make that kind of transition when you're so used to using publisher materials. But it can, it can be done. I think Larry and Jody are both um, amazing and excellent examples of how to do it and how to do it successfully. So again, I want to thank everyone um, for joining us today and uh, we hope to see you in the community email. Thanks very much.